it, there's no sport like it because you are trusting your dogs. I can't explain that in words. It's like living, breathing, moving art. You know when you know what your dog's thinking, but they can't talk? That's something special. This is my story. A story about a journey into the world of sprint sled dogs, which is far bigger and far more exciting than I could have ever dreamed of. From South America to Australia, to England and Europe, and all over North America, people from all walks of life are discovering that they can race dogs on dirt, on snow, in small teams of one to two dogs, large teams of eight to 14 dogs. People are racing locally in their clubs and they're working to get all the way to the world championship. We don't know really what the maximum speed these guys can maintain. Records are being broken all the time. By playing, training, and competing together, dogs and their human companions form an incredible bond. What binds people together, and also what binds people and dogs together, is actually shared experiences. No matter what you do, <laughs> they love you anyway. They're always so happy, and we need that. I got into dog powered sports when I saw my neighbor. Michael Wason being pulled by three wired haired pointers on snow, and I thought, I definitely want to do that. I thought I needed a great sled dog. One that was good in the snow and loved to pull. So like most people, I knew the Iditarod and I knew what dogs looked like in the Iditarod. They look amazing and strong and beautiful and, and uh, furry and Siberian-like. So I went on the internet and looked for the most beautiful Siberian Husky I could find, and that's how I got Misty. My dream was to get into this sport, work really, really hard, train Misty to the best of her abilities, and with her desire and my goals to become world champion. You know, did all of the normal training that I read in books with Misty, did some jogging and some biking and let her bones grow up, fed her really amazing food. I read in books how humbling and magical it was to have the experience where the dog you trained pulled you really fast down the trail. And I wanted that. Five, four, three, two, one. Hike up. Let's go. It's a really tough moment when you have hopes and dreams and you're in this sport and you realize your dog's not that into it. You didn't get the right dog. Hike up. No, that's the wrong way. Let's go. And I was pretty frustrated. I had already committed a couple years to this project. And I asked everybody, hey, who has the fastest dogs? And, uh, and I did Rod Musher, who's a neighbor friend of mine, actually sent me a Facebook message. And he said, simply, Eggle Ellis has the fastest sled dogs in the world. My name is Egil Ellis. Uh, I'm 45 and I'm from Sweden, racing for Team USA. Until recently, Egil lived in Alaska, where he dominated the race circuit for over 15 years. I've been racing dogs since I was 15 years old. It was my dad who introduced me to it. And my brother and I got a husky puppy each for Christmas in 82. 
1991, I think it was the last year I raced Siberians. And I started looking at other dogs, faster dogs. Engel got a faster dog by crossing a German chore hair pointer and an Alaskan Husky. The dogs were lean and light and strong. These dogs eventually became known as the Eurohound. Engel bred them specifically for open class races. These are the longest races in sprint mushing with the biggest dog teams. The dogs are, are usually a bit smaller in open class, uh, just because they, there's more dogs, they don't have to pull so much. It was through meeting Eggle that I really learned what a proper dog yard is really all about. When you think about the 365 day part of dog care, making sure that every athlete on your team has exactly what they need to be healthy and successful. You need to have a proper yard. You have to have a proper housing for them. You doesn't have to love scooping poop, but you have to do it. You cannot leave it. If you're good at it, you can you could read a dog and you can understand a dog just by looking at it. They can't talk, but they have a perfectly understandable body language. I mean, one of the really big advantages of buying dogs from Eggle is that because he doesn't sell puppies, they've all trained with his team for a year, and they are ripped. When he lived in Alaska, Eggle had a special wheel for the low-impact aerobic conditioning of his dogs. Then they moved to a four-wheeler, where the dogs learned to pull and work super hard as a team. Training is, uh, shouldn't always be perfect. It should be about making mistakes at home so you don't have to do it at a, at a race. breeding and the training and nutrition and strength building and all that there's a much deeper level where success really comes from and that's the trust building it's a connection that the mushers have with their dogs When these dogs are trained well, the athletic performance they're capable of is hard for us as humans to even imagine. Dr. Arlie Reynolds is a world champion, open class racer, and the associate dean, Department of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. You know, the VO2 max of these guys are incredible. The VO2 max is a, a thing that we measure as exercise physiologists. It sort of tells us the size of the motor, okay? So it's the maximum amount of oxygen that can be processed by the body per unit time per unit body weight. So we usually put it in mils per kilogram body weight per minute, okay? The, the highest one measured in a human was in Bjorn Dolly, the cross-country skier. His was 92. I put my dogs on a treadmill and use the same type of system they use to measure human athletes. And dogs like my main leader will have a VO2 max around 240 mils per kilogram per minute, or about three times higher than the greatest one ever measured in a human being. Most college endurance athletes are in the 60s. Uh, Lance Armstrong was in the mid 80s. So 240 is really off the charts.
In 2011, I bought a dog named Quinn from Eggle Ellis. And then in 2012, I asked Eggle for a second dog so I could have a two dog team. Yeah. I know, this has got to be so weird. You just left the county of that for two years and seven months. And you're a pretty good boy, except you're having fun dominating right now, aren't you? And Misty, you're just sexy. Straight up gorgeous. That's all there is to it. Poppy loved running with Quinny. And in fact, Poppy's the kind of dog who would look over at Quinn while they're racing and like almost say something in his ear, like, let's go faster, let's go faster. Training runs all of a sudden became bliss. And it was incredible having, I thought I had Ferraris. I knew I had Ferraris. They were, I could see them. They were working so well together. We had an awesome season and were nearly undefeated leading up to the World Championship. So we were delighted. Of course, I was still learning how to ski. <laughs> Skate ski was really, really hard. That is not the way to finish, go ahead. And so if you guys ever get into ski dog sports, you gotta make it fun for the dogs. Like this for them is so much fun and we just encourage it. We want them to have fun. So we went into the Alaska for the 2013 World Championship pretty excited. One of my mentors who was a previous medalist, took me aside and said, you have a chance at the podium in the two-dog race. And so I went in that race, really gunning for top three, and knowing that I was gonna have to go up against the best in the world. But I thought, hey, I've got the fastest dogs in the world. We have a chance. We entered every single event, all five Nordic events. Things didn't really go as well as I had hoped. In our very first World Championship race, Quinny and Poppy and I were passed three times. We saw amazing skiers with amazing dogs flow right by us. We had been dominating our races. We weren't used to getting passed, and these guys were averaging 22 miles per hour over six miles. Holy shit. I also learned something new about my dogs. Yes, they are absolutely the fastest dogs in the world at open class racing that Eggle does, which are those longer 24 mile races. And what I discovered is that the Europeans breed their own specialized dog just for ski touring and short sprint races. We couldn't compete with the Europeans. And that after all that, we actually, I got the wrong dogs again. But when I reflected on that year and thought, well, should I keep training? Should I keep trying to become better? I realized I had made so many mistakes getting into the sport. The dream to be the best had been replaced by this goal of sharing. So I traveled to Europe to meet and learn from some of the best mushers in the world. One of the people I was really intent on getting to know was the breeder who was responsible for a lot of the dogs that people are really successful with a woman from Norway named Lena boysen hillestad When I was very, very little, like five years, my parents actually, they asked me if I wanted a sister or brother or a dog. What a stupid question for a five-year-old. So I'm the only child and uh, <laughs> I'm really into this sport. On my first race, I was this big. <laughs> she has 23 World Championship gold medals, which is more than anyone else alive. It's very popular to say, have fun, but it's really important too. So if you're not happy around them, they will notice at once. And dogs are like that. Like most people in Norway, Lena grew up with the German Shorthair Pointer, which is a really fast and strong hunting dog that can pull straight ahead. She thought it was possible to mix Greyhound with the dogs that they're already using in Norway. Mixing Greyhound and GSP was 
probably just uh, the idea of uh, having a, a faster dog in the beginning. Today, people call these dogs graysters. The greyhounds, they have more longer back, longer legs, and a very nice way of running. As you can see on the greyhound buses, that's the way they run, actually. In addition to having the speed, it was their mind. They were more soft than a GSP, more calm to have inside the house. Just like family members. Her dogs are specifically for that shorter distance where they can maintain extremely high speeds for four to six miles. Pretty much everywhere in the sled dog world, you'll see gracers. Kart racing, canacross, bike touring, ski touring. So the question is, why doesn't everyone use gracers when they race short distances? Well, there are a lot of really fast breeds. And ultimately, it's not just about speed. This isn't a motorcycle you're buying, it's a companion. And that is also why it's important to pick a puppy that you really love from the first sight, from your stomach feeling, instead of measuring and taking the one that's supposed to be very good. So I think you can achieve a lot more with a, with a dog you really love and like. I met a lot of Norwegians that are still running pure German short hair pointers. They are winning world championships left and right, just like the Greyster. My morning starts about six o'clock, and then uh, it's always uh, the dogs before everything else. I always have these uh, short haired uh, German pointers. It's a bird dog from the start. Uh, you can go skiing, you can go do the races and you can also go hunting. The perfect dog for you might even be a Siberian Husky. It's a love thing, I think. When you, once you had Huskies, they are excellent family dogs. They're so easy and they, they want to please you and they're especially good in long distance and middle distance uh, races. Sprint races aren't really for me. I like being out in the nature, a couple of hours, four hours, five hours, whatever it takes. It just calms you down and you just enjoy it in a different way. Uh, what would my life be otherwise? I don't know, maybe I would be dead because I was so depressed after my accident. I don't know, but uh, they saved my life. Tina had to stop racing her dogs and stop keeping dogs after breaking her back at a racing event. There's no, no handicapped person that is exactly like the other handicapped person. You can have high or low spinal cord injury or MS or whatever, or amputated or everything. like. So you have to custom make your way how to adapt it to you. Of course, this is a little bit more difficult when if you have a lot of snow. I had to stop uh, having dogs and start my rehabilitation. Then I was trying to find some other kind of uh, activities to do, like wheelchair racing. But there was nothing that was as um, fulfilling as the sled dog sport had been, and having dogs, training dogs. I was very depressed, but I had a dear Marshall friend, Jan Svensson, who had a puppy and he thought, OK, I give this puppy to you and I hope that you start taking care of this puppy and stop being so depressed. I soon realized that um, 
he could pull my wheelchair. I called him cool, and that means fun. He was my dog back to life again. The dogs are everything for me. I have built my, my life around them. Tina has hacked her equipment so she can train her dogs year round in Sweden. When you have your accident, your life changes so drastically. You get in terms with your handicap, but it's still not you. You are not you are not a handicapped person inside. I like to make goals that are impossible and try to get there. Then, if I don't make it, it's not the whole world, but uh, I, at least I have tried. When you go out to the woods with the dogs, it's like you never have uh, had your accident. You're back in the woods on the trail, and uh, it's a chilling moment when you first realize, okay, I can still do that. So that's a, it, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful feeling. So Tina has sort of scraped together some parts and pieces and made her own sled. The speeds of six and eight dogs, which is where she really wants to be racing in the eight dog class, is just way too much for this little homemade sled that she works with. Uh, my idea is to, to make the, the sled more flexible is that you can use your upper body to, to help to steer the sled. You can do like this in the curves. She believes she can compete against able-bodied mushers and win. What she needs is a super modern sled, engineered to be able to handle these corners at high speeds. My idea is that uh, to build the sled with like this so I can tilt the skis. Can you see it? What she's done in the meantime is asked her mushing friend, Lars Lind, who's accomplished, talented, and dedicated, to race her team for her in one of the most special relationships that there is in the mushing world. Lars has been mushing himself so much, so he has this eye to see which dogs can, uh, uh, can make a good team. It's, uh, it's a talent, it's a talent. Of course, everybody can stand in behind the sled, but not everybody has that eye to see which dog is really good. In 2015, I traveled to the Black Forest of Germany, where I could watch Tyne and Lars compete with 
mushers from all sorts of countries, including Scandinavia, Europe, Australia, England, and North America. There's something so special about World Championship Race Days. You can just feel it in the parking lot with everybody nervously getting ready. You can see it in the dogs. They anticipate something's going on. You can see it in the crowd. So all kinds of races. There's the one and two dog races, the four, six, and eight dog races, and then they have unlimited class. You rarely ever see the polk in North America, but in Scandinavia, the polk is a really important part of their racing tradition. Its roots go back to polar exploration, search and rescue, and adventure with families going out in the snow, pulling here on their sleds. Mass start is where all the dog teams line up side by side by side, and they all start at the exact same time. And it's just a really spectacular show for the crowd. So one of the really exciting things about the 2015 World Championship was that Tyne and Lars got to face off against Egel in the eight dog sprint class. On the very first day of Egel's race, his wheel dog, the back dog, <clears throat> snapped at the start line the tug that holds the dog to the sled. And so the clock starts and Egel has to run out as the clock's ticking and try to repair this broken tug line. So on the very first day, he loses 17 seconds. He ended day one in fourth place. On day two, Egel's team was still in fourth place. And on day three, in the rain in the Black Forest, on a very tough course, he ran one of the most incredible sprint races we've ever seen. I was at the bottom of Kill Hill when I filmed him passing that team, and I did not expect to see the incredible speed. Hey, bro, Eggle's charging up hill right behind number three. I grabbed my camera gear and started running uphill because it was announced that he won the gold medal. That's one hell of a comeback. That's really hard to do, to make up that much time on day three, in the rain, in the Black Forest, in terrible conditions on an uphill run. Two hours later, uh, they actually discovered a timing error, and Egel uh, did not win the gold medal. He came in second by 4.4 seconds. So that 17 seconds on day one cost him the gold medal. Tyne and Lars' team were in medal contention the whole time. They had a great first day, they had a great second day, and then Egel came from behind and bumped them to bronze. And in the end, neither Egel nor Lars could catch face of Pekka Limataki, who got the gold. You know, I wanted Tyna to get the gold, and, and I think she will someday. I think that, and hopefully, Tyna will get the gold on a sled that somebody helps her make that's going to be a world class sled. We're going to have an adaptive world champion. So I went to the 2015 Winter World Championships in Germany and the 2015 Dryland World Championships in Canada. Not so much to race. I did act as team captain for USA, but I really went to learn as much as I could, to talk to the best of the best, to spend a lot of time in conversation, figuring out what it is that makes them successful. Use your dog's strength, use your dog's interest, what he loves, and have fun with him. My advice is to have fun, uh, work hard with the dogs, uh, be patient, keep you and the dog healthy, and uh, give the dogs a lot of love. It's a way of living. Of course, we love our dogs and uh, yeah, they are family members.
choose really um, good lines, good dogs, because once you have a dog, you keep him for life. When you're running a race, your dogs, they don't know if you come first or you come last. They just want to have a good run, right? Yeah, as long as you come back smiling, you know, it's a good run. I think the smaller classes are really getting big worldwide, you know, the one and two dog and the canny cross and bike joining especially. I was so bored going alone and running all by myself. And running with a dog just makes it so much more fun. There is still so much to share, and our goal is to build a dog-loving community of people who can share that information more freely because we want the people getting in the sport to have the best success they can. It isn't like buying a mountain bike and then putting it in the garage. This is a living, breathing soul. You know, I think we're hardwired really to be with dogs. No matter what level you do it, whether you're a recreational person or you're trying to win a big, important race, I mean, dog mushing is such a wonderful thing that is such an important part of life. I am in awe of the relationship between people and dogs. I think that when that is done properly, it, is the, it makes us both the best we can be. Oh, my God.